Okay, well, I pray that you understand too, but uh, I hate to be mean, but since they're, we're not full up front and I want to kind of save my voice and not have to shout all the way to the back, can I ask you guys to come at least up past the divider? Very good. Okay, well, on the little uh, thing, it said we'd talk about games, engagement, and agency. Are computer games the solution to engagement in learning? And, uh, and what does agency have to do with engagement? Well, this is actually kind of a nice quote. When computer games came along, it actually became pretty obvious pretty fast that children were engaged with computer games. And so educators started taking a look at computer games thinking, wow, we don't get this kind of engagement. Wouldn't it be nice to get it? And there were a couple of other factors in there, too. The other thing was they knew that students would be engaged in play, but play was usually considered something that you did more actively, right? It was noisy, it was rambunctious, you were running around. That's generally kind of what you think of as play. But here were students who were able to sit in a chair now without fidgeting for hours, and yet they're still in some measure very active. And so this seems like kind of an ideal situation for a classroom, right? Now you can do active things inside the confines of a classroom or even a desk instead of having kids up and running around and losing control and so on and so forth. So that was kind of the initial um, attraction of computer games to education was we can gain engagement and yet still keep them contained in a classroom. So then in about 2001, Mark Prensky comes along. He's, he's really kind of the one that, that really got the ball rolling in this decade on games and education with his book, Digital Game-Based Learning. And one of the things he claims is not only is it engaging, but computer games embody sound learning principles. They're good learning. And he also... Um, opens up this conversation that we're still talking about now, that, that digital natives, um, the millennial generation, are used to working on a computer and they're going to learn better if they do things on a computer and computer games are one of the best ways to do that kind of thing on a computer. And then just a little while after, James Paul Gee is a professor of literacy, very well respected in his field, and he publishes a book uh, about video games and how they, are, they embody sound learning principles. And the thing that this, these two together, this one was really the one, though, I think, that started making academics think that games and education were more than just um, anecdotal evidence, you know, a bunch of gamers who think this would be good and they want to sell a bunch of edutainment titles. But actually there was some academic... Uh, foundation to the idea that games could provide a good learning experience. Um, one of the things, and you may have all heard some of this talk, uh, Prensky and others have basically said that, uh, kind of predicting that computer games will eventually become the method of teaching and learning, um, that they're the best way to do it. And there are Quotes like these, I thought this one was interesting, that you could get a degree by beating the boss in a computer game, is what he's arguing, right? Well, so, yeah, Rick. Well, I shouldn't be asking a question so, far, <laughs> so soon, but we talk about test anxiety. Is there like game anxiety where it's like every time I meet up with the boss or the ogre or whatever, <laughs> at the end, I can never pass this. Um, yes, but no. That's one of the things. That's one of the things that games do well. 
Uh, but that's a whole other discussion. Um, but I'll give you three words. Risk with recoverability. Okay. That's, true. that's what games do. Okay, so what does the research actually say about the effectiveness of computer games in education? Uh, games are engaging. That's true. In general, games are engaging. Um, but it's also true that not everybody likes games. Um, even among the males, although it's also the difference is greater between males and females. Males tend to prefer games. Females tend to not enjoy the games as much. Um, there's also some research out there, the idea of, of digital natives or the millennial generation, that they learn better through digital media. Um, there are some studies out there that support that. There are some other studies out there that contradict that. Um, in fact, kind of show the opposite. That, and, and my read on it is... As I look at, and, and I haven't done an extensive review of this literature. This is just stuff I've kind of picked up kind of out of interest as I've been reading along. But my take on it is that what's going on really is the level of autonomy seems to be the factor in this research here, that students who have a higher level of autonomy are more comfortable in a digital environment, and students who prefer more structure and less independence um, prefer a face-to-face -face environment, a more traditional approach. And so it, it also kind of turns out that older students tend to be more autonomous than freshmen and sophomores who are part of the millennial generation. Uh, we haven't defined good games. But that's another thing, too. That's another implication here is that, well, not all games are good. When, when when people are thinking about games, they're thinking about the good games usually and overlooking that there are a few thousand bad games for every one blockbuster super game. So I've qualified it, but that's a discussion for another time too, probably. But that is one of the things is, you know, this is for good games and not all games are good. Uh, in fact, uh, Pappert says that educational games, and this was back about 10 years ago though, educational games uh, represent what he calls a Shavian reversal. They inherit the bad traits of both parents. So they're neither engaging nor very good instructionally. Yeah. Good games, it does play out that good games do seem to embody sound learning principles, but there are still some, some caveats with that. One is the game, the game itself can get in the way of learning. There is a question out there, well, yes, it's sound learning principles, but what are they learning? Is it sound learning in terms of learning to play the game and win the game? Or is it actually sound learning in terms of what they're supposed to be learning outside of the game? That is a problem with school in general. Yeah, that is. That is. Um, but oftentimes, this is what seems to be happening. It's great learning principles in terms of learning the game. It's a little bit more questionable when it comes to the actual learning outcome that you're looking for in terms of education. And then what often happens is, as the next bullet says, the teacher often has to step in to help them take what they learned in the game and apply it to whatever else they're learning. Um, and so there's still, you still haven't removed that intervention from the teacher. The game doesn't stand alone. And another downfall of games, unless you're talking about edutainment, the good games tend to emphasize engagement. They will craft the game to be engaging and they will sacrifice um, reality or what's the word I'm looking at here? Accuracy. They will sacrifice accuracy for engagement. Okay? And this is, 
this is part of the design of games. They represent a simplified model, generally speaking. Games have to be simpler because computers can't do everything. And one of the design elements of games uh, is this idea of an emotional reality, that reality is boring. <laughs> right? Oftentimes, reality is boring, so we're going to heighten the contrast. We're going to up the emotional content to make the game more engaging. So it's an emotional reality, not reality. And then again, teachers have to off report having to help students unlearn. Students apply that simplified model and it's not good enough, and they kind of have to help them unlearn what they learned in the game and reconfigure it for the real world. Do you have a question? Can you give an example of emotional reality? Just kind of playing things up to be more, more dramatic. Than Basically, yeah. Um, one of, the, one of the prominent game designers gives this example that if you make a World War II um, air combat game, well, if you look at the reality of the situation, there were hours and hours spent just flying around, and half the time you never did meet an enemy, and you just returned to base and nothing ever happened. Well, that would be a boring game, right? So what they do is they make sure that you run into an enemy really fast and they emphasize all the fun aspects of fighting and not the realistic aspects of air combat and some of the more boring aspects of air combat. So. I, I had a question too about the unlearn. Is that because the model itself just didn't map onto reality at all or is it because the students couldn't take what they've learned now and make the connections to reality or it's, it's a little of both. It's a little of both. The, the model that they have is, is simplified. It may not be entirely accurate. It may lead to some, some logical leaps that, that aren't really justified. So could the um, teachers just help the students make correct associations based on what they've learned rather than unlearning the model they've just learned? Well, essentially, what they say basically is the students come out, can come out of the game thinking that, they've, that the game represents reality, right? And they kind of have to help them get over that idea that, that this is not reality. They're, you know. There was another. Yeah, I, I just watched um, a, um, a, a talk by Albert Bernard uh, yesterday at a board conference, and uh, he was showing uh, exactly what you're trying to uh, point out here in this one, uh, rather than the last generation. What is an example where this man has been engaging in just uh, on a computer in a virtual relationship with someone he's never met before. And he has gone all the way to, he was so emotionally involved that he's gone all the way to so Far East to uh, live such and such when his wife uh, was sitting in the next room watching TV. Yeah, yeah. One of the dangers, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit too. Okay, so. Some of the conclusions, yes, computer games can increase engagement in general. Uh, they do facilitate aspects of learning. Um, there is this idea that they can actually be fairly active in a computer game, and yet they're still, the classroom is orderly, they're not running around, um, they're engaged. Uh, one of the things that, that was noted in the research, too, was that after they played the game, um, it prompted good discussion, good questions. And, and I think, and this is my kind of spin on that, I guess, is that 
with all of them having played the game together and the teacher knowing that they played the game, the game this also served as a common reference point. They could all talk about this thing uh, in terms of what they were trying to learn. And so it wasn't a matter of trying to find different examples that they could all relate to. They all had this example in common uh, that they could relate to. And that seemed to help the discussion and dialogue in the classroom. Um, also, games can do things that you just can't do. They can, you know, one of the things that they say is they can kind of take you to a different location. They can put you in a different situation, uh, at least simulated, uh, that you would never be able to do in a real classroom. Um, and so that's one of the, the benefits. Um, but overall, at least the current state of games, they appear to be part of the solution. And I don't have any problem with games. I, games have been in education for a long time. Um, all kinds of different games, and that's fine. Um, but they're not a complete solution, at least not yet. Nobody's come up with the game that can, seems to be able to stand all by itself, and students come out and they have really learned what they needed to learn. Um, in general, it seems to be that a teacher's intervention is always necessary to make sure that they got what they needed out of the game and to correct um, some misconceptions and errors that they picked up during the game. So, if games are not the solution, they're not the, the blanket solution, does that mean that education is doomed to be boring? Or that might lead us to this question, can we learn about a, engagement through computer games by looking at computer games with these premises, right? That engagement is a question of human nature. Human beings get engaged. Somehow or other, computer games seem to tap into human nature to get people engaged in them, right? So the question is, how do they do that? What do they trigger in our natures that uh, gets us to be so involved? So, Andy gave me a nice plug for my dissertation. If you want the, if you want the long answer, you can go read my dissertation uh, online. But basically, the idea is computer games create a feed-forward effect, okay, which is a new term probably for most of you. We'll talk about that. Um, and basically, what one of the ideas is that players invest of themselves in the game. When they enter the game, even if it's a board game and you have that little token, the little plastic token, that little plastic token becomes you. It's no longer a little piece of plastic, right? So you have invested of yourself in the game. And the game essentially keeps you investing until the end. Keeps investing that sense of self through meaningful challenge, a metaphorical reality, um, organic helps, a meaningful challenge. Challenge is one of the things that all game designers basically say are a part of games. One of the ideas, though, is this idea of meaningful. It needs to be meaningful. Um, that meaning, though, for a game can exist solely inside the game. So you'll notice that a lot of games the kind of the classic games, you're going to save the world, or you need to save the princess, you need to do something big, some big meaningful accomplishment, right, in terms of that world or that situation, um, is often one of the selling points to get you engaged. So meaning, um, it's not just challenge alone, it, the value of it also plays out. Uh, metaphorical reality, Again, games can't represent reality. If they did, of course, it would be reality. So they give you a subset of reality. And some games are even abstract. But one of the arguments is that, so like Tetris is a very engaging game, but it's completely abstract. Um, so one of the arguments is there are metaphors that underlie even those abstract games that we kind of resonate with. Um, and that's one of the appeals. So, for example, um, some of the metaphors offered for Tetris are that um, it kind of represents the mechanized 
world that we live in. Uh, things just happen, you know, this machine just constantly going, constantly going, and you've got to stay up with the mechanism of society and technology and so forth, and, and you're desperately trying to keep up, right? And so survival is another metaphor of Tetris, the idea of survival. So a metaphorical reality. Um, all games provide helps. The best ones do it in a way that you hardly know that you're being helped. Uh, some of the best examples that I've experienced myself are in combat games where you have this, you're supposedly in a squad of other soldiers and you're out there fighting the enemy and you've got a radio and, and the soldiers, the other troops are talking to you, you know, and so it's like you're playing the game with these troops, but what they're doing actually are giving you hints and clues and, and what to do next and things like that, that are actually helping you move forward in the game, and yet it doesn't feel like somebody's really helping you. Or even maps that kind of show the optimal path, if you want to look at it, things like that. Um, do is they provide an elegant means to express agency. And that is going to be... Uh, the subject of most of the rest of our conversation today is this idea of agency in games. So what I'm going to offer to you today is this idea of agency as we will discuss it is actually the key to engagement. This notion of expressing agency. Um, and to do that, to do that I'm going to have to take you through a little tour of systems theory I hope it's not too painful. Me, I hope I can make it less painful for you than it was for me. Okay, in systems theory, we have basically two kinds. They talk about two kinds of systems. Feedback systems, which we're all pretty familiar with, I think. We all have heard the term feedback. But there's also this idea of feed-forward systems. And there are two types of feed-forward systems. But it turns out that this idea of feed-forward systems has been around in systems theory for almost as long as systems theory has been around, except it's kind of been lost and rediscovered and lost again and rediscovered um, for a couple of reasons. One is that feedback systems can model feed-forward systems effectively enough, and feedback systems are cheap to manufacture. So from an industrial standpoint, feedback systems were a very effective and cost-efficient way of, of controlling a system. Feed-forward systems were very expensive, and until the age of computers, feed-forward systems were largely impractical. Now with computer systems, we can actually start to generate um, this idea of adaptive, actually adaptive feed-forward systems. They really weren't very possible until the age of computers. Now what happened was that in order to get the benefit of feed-forward systems, um, they relied on an operator, a human being, generally speaking, who had the adaptive capability. So that's how they got around uh, the idea, that's how they got around the limitations of feedback systems when they needed it. So let's go through a little quick refresher here just to bring everybody up to speed. A feedback system is characterized by an input. It has a controller that, that controls this process, and this process has an output. And a feedback system is so-called because the output here is fed back as input. Okay? So we have the classic example is a thermostat. You have an input here, and you have a thermostat, and then you have the heater that it controls, right, which outputs heat, which then also goes back in as input. So the thermostat is monitoring the heat level, and so basically, when it gets a little bit too cold, the thermostat says, I don't have enough. I'm going to turn on the process, the heater. It outputs heat. That heat then is monitored 
as input by the thermostat. And when the heat gets a little just right or a little bit too high, the thermostat says, OK, I've got enough heat. I'm going to turn off the process. And I'm going to continue to monitor the heat, right? So the output is fed back as input. Now, there are a couple of attributes. Feedback systems are reactionary. That means an error, an error in systems terms, has to occur before feedback systems react. So the error in this case is there are two errors that happen. The first error is when the heat goes below the, the threshold, and that's an error, so it kicks on and turns on the heater. The next error is when the heat goes above the threshold, and the system turns off the heater. So there are two errors. And so feedback systems are also characterized by this vacillation around the mean, right? This wave configuration around the mean. Now, for a lot of things, that's perfectly fine. It's OK that, that the temperature fluctuates by 2 degrees, or even more, if you want it to, right? We can survive with that kind of variation. That's no problem. So for a lot of things, a feedback system is very good. The, the amount of variability that we can handle is, is fine. Feedback systems can handle it. Um, so again, that's one of the reasons why they're popular. Um, but also, feedback systems do not learn. They just react according to what they're already set to do. OK? OK, the other type of Feed, or the first type of feed-forward system is called an open-loop system. And the classic example of that one is, is an automatic sprinkler system. So you have a controller. Do you have any other colors in the marker? Yeah. So you have your controller here. Which you have set up in anticipation um, that your lawn is going to need water every two or three days. Right? And so that controller just sits there. And when its thing kicks off, it outputs water. Now, what's the drawback to this system? Well, if it rains, you don't need water or something to that Right. It's the classic example, right? It's raining, and the sprinklers turn on, right? Or it rained yesterday, and the sprinklers still come on. There's no way for this system to know whether you really need it or not, to know whether, it, to know whether you've got enough, whether you've got too much, whether you've got too little. It just kicks on and acts based on its model and doesn't monitor the, the outcome like a feedback system does, right? So even though it's anticipatory, it's set up to anticipate a future thing, it can't learn. It just does what it does, and it could be very wrong. And it's still going to do it. So you can imagine open loop systems don't get used very much, right? There's another kind of feed forward system that's called, a, that basically we're going to call adaptive systems. There are a lot of different names. You might have heard of feed forward neural, ne neural networks, artificial neural networks. These are common in artificial intelligence, and this is where. A lot of the research on feed-forward systems is taking place is in computer science. And this model comes from a feed-forward neural network, a very simple one. There are all kinds of different flavors. And you still have an input. And here you have several neurons. And by the way, artificial intelligence is modeled after the way that the human brain works according to the physiology that we currently know. They've modeled it after the way the human brain works. Okay? 
So there's a neuron, several neurons. They receive the input. They process the input in the neuron, and they send it to an output layer. OK, now that output layer does something interesting. When it receives, when it receives the output, there is a desired state that it's looking for. And it compares the output it gets from the neurons to this desired state. And then it sends back to each neuron an error signal. How much error did you have compared to the desired state? OK. And it also sends back a weighting value. And that weight value, that weighting that it gives the neuron is basically, well, you're the, you're the closest one or you're farther away. I'm going to pay more attention to the one that's closest. I'm going to give it more weight, you know, when I, when I output. I'm going to give that one more weight. And the idea there that that's what happens with the way we build our brains, right? That we have all this activity going on in our brains. And the things that seem to work, the things that come closest to our approximation, we send it more chemical signal. That chemical signal gets stronger, essentially. So we're going to listen to that neuron more than we are to some of the other ones, because we're going to remove some chemical signal from the other ones that don't seem to approximate what we're trying to, to get. So that's kind of the idea behind this waiting, is it's kind of this idea that we're going to pay more attention to that, to that node, if you will. OK, so this is where it gets kind of hard. This took me a long time. This, this, is called, this is only one system of learning, by the way. This is called backpropagation. Um, there are other types of, of learning systems uh, in artificial intelligence. But this is one of the more simple ones, so we'll do that. Anybody notice, I'm, I'm just going to throw it out, see how good you are. Can anybody see what's different about this model than the feedback model? It changes the process. OK, it changes the process. So here's our feedback model. Here's our controller. What's changing? What's changing here? The output is the output is changing and that changes the input. The controller, the model in the controller stays the same. These neurons, when they receive that delta, that uh, error value, they adjust how they process the input. OK. Is the input changing? Is the output being fed back as input? No. No, even though, no, it's not. But indirectly, though. No. No. See, that, that was, it, I know, it took me a long time. I sat there thinking, I, I, I looked at that for days, thinking, what is the difference? I mean, there's still communication going backward, right? What's the difference? The difference is, again, this does not change. It never changes. The only thing that changes is output and input. And the input changes because the output changes. What changes here is not the input. It changes how you process the input, how you control the system. It changes the controller. So the controller is learning. Can you qualify learning? I'll agree with you if you say yes. it's adapting, but what do you mean by learning? Learning means that it basically the idea is that this system is trying to reach this goal state, right? right. This desired state. It's a pre-programmed desired state. Though. Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. And we're talking about system. artificial intelligence right. right here, right now, OK? Um, we can move to organic systems <laughs> later. 
trying to reach this goal state, right? And it's doing so, these neurons are trying to approximate that, and they're learning in the sense that they're getting better. With each iteration, they're getting better at more accurately achieving the goal state. So is there a transformation of the input as the controller no. continues? So the trans that's, the, that's the key difference. The transformation is here. The transformation is in these neurons and how they process the input, okay. what they do with it, how they control the system. But they're still processing or transforming the input to create a desired state. Yes. Yeah. But, okay. <laughs> so, it, this may be one of those that doesn't sound like a big difference, but when you start to think about it, it makes a big difference. Okay, even though there's information flowing back, it's not feedback. Okay, because you're changing the model. That's very important. The input. Right. Um, yes. Let's see, if we, t if we could make a thermostat into a feed-forward system, well, let's say that we needed to keep the temperature very tightly controlled. Okay, and I'm using this because this is, this is a common metaphor, right, that we can use. So you could have a feed-forward system then that controls your heater. It's still, it has input, the heat of the room. It might have other inputs. For example, it might have a, a temperature sensor outside. Okay, so it could be measuring the, the temperature outside. It could then be calculating, for example, calculating the heat loss between the inside temperature and the outside temperature. And so then forecasting how quickly is heat going to be lost from this room. And it would then be operating on the basis of that prediction. Okay, that's another important thing. Operating on the basis of that prediction that heat is going to be lost at such and such a rate. So it's going to start outputting heat at that rate. Okay? And then it can act, does that make sense? It's going to output in anticipation of heat loss. The heat loss hasn't yet occurred, quote unquote. It hasn't reached an error threshold yet. So if its model is correct, that heat will stay stable, right? But if it's off, then that feed-forward system can also see, well, I'm still losing temperature or I'm gaining temperature. I need to adjust my model. I need to not output so much heat. So, with, so it could be saying with this temperature outside and this temperature inside, the heat loss is actually what I thought it was plus or minus some error factor, right? So I need to adjust my calculation by this much to better predict the heat loss. Okay, so it has just learned that this room doesn't lose heat according to its original calculation. This room loses heat, maybe for other reasons, at this calculation. Or it may have to keep successively approximating that until it finally gets to a point where it can actually... So the idea, so where I... See, I, I knew this was going to be painful, I'm sorry. So a feedback system will vacillate about the mean. Right? And we say, that's fine. No problem. I can stand plus or minus two degrees. No problem. But the idea of, of this that we're talking about right here is you don't want to vacillate around the mean. Or if you do, you want it to be so small, much smaller. But you really don't want, you don't, you're trying to prevent a future occurrence or to make a future thing happen. Okay? Is that clear as mud? I'm just trying to see if I understood to see related back to uh, the gaming uh, situation. Would it be like a constant adaptive engagement based on the situation, whether it be virtual or real? Yes. Yeah. So you could say that the desired state over here is to win right, in a game. The desired state is to win. The inputs in the game 
are what they're, that's what the game's going to give you. That's what you've got. You're going to get what the game gives you. What you can change is how you process it, right? How you adapt to it. So the game would make itself harder. The game could make itself harder, yeah. One, one of the, this is one of the good things about computer games is that they can be adaptive as well. So when you get good, they can also get, when you get better, they can get better. Right? But it doesn't have to be, but that's one of the things that they actually do. Yeah. By the way, there's a, a, a speed, uh, what is it? Uh, Cruise control. Is that a speed control system also? No. Oh. Why? Because it doesn't <laughs> kick on. It doesn't kick on until you until you cross a threshold that is an error condition, right? You go below your desired, you go below your desired speed, and then it kicks on, and it'll even push you up a little bit higher often, and then it'll kick off, right? And so you, you'll do this thing again. If it were to be a feed forward system, we could make a cruise control system that would be feed forward. We could have, for, you know, this is maybe well, it's not so pie in the sky. We have some little laser thing on front of our car and it's looking at the road ahead of us and it sees a slope coming up and it calculates the gradient of the slope and it says in order to maintain my speed on that gradient of slope I'm going to need X number or X more gas pumping through my engine to keep my speed and so before it even slows down right it's giving it more gas to try and keep that speed where it wants it. And then as you crest, it'll see the drop in elevation, and it'll try to anticipate what's going to happen and back off, right? So it's anticipating and trying to adapt to what's going to happen, what it thinks is going to happen. Now, its model, this is where, again, learning, well, maybe, it, maybe something else is going on, and it didn't, its model didn't quite help it stay at that level. So it says, well, how much was I off? Well, you were off by this much. Okay, I'll adjust my model by that much and see if that works. So it's, it's this idea that it's still refining itself, right? If it's truly feed forward. So in a, in a feed forward adaptive system, you're really going to start out with some large vacillations and then get smaller. Yes. And uh, you might think about children learning to walk, right? So here are a few things about adaptive systems. They are anticipatory. Feedback systems are reactionary. They react when an error occurs. Adaptive systems are anticipatory. They try to prevent an error or to influence the outcome or to achieve an outcome, either positive or negative, you could look at it either way, to achieve an outcome ahead of time. They're trying to affect the course of events ahead of time. And they learn, they adapt. They figure out what they did wrong and try something else. Okay? In other words, they can learn. Adaptive systems can learn. And this is also another interesting thing. The purpose of learning is to improve their predictions, their ability to predict and then act in order to achieve that future state. In the, uh, in, like, machines and computers, um, it, it seems like the uh, the adapt adaptations come uh, would come in in the uh, in the, the existing components um, learning uh, about mostly the weight versus um, like in a, a more organic or human model maybe additional components would be added like we realize oh you know we need to consider are we going to have picnics out on the lawn, you know, someday with this sprinkler system versus uh, just connecting it with the 
the fact that we had already just met the norm then. Right, 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 right. And we're just dealing with simple models here. But, but yeah, you get more complex, you can get more complex systems. Okay. Okay, now this is also another thing too. Adaptive systems can be feed forward only. But a lot of really good systems, especially biological systems, contain both feed forward and feedback mechanisms. So they have both. So you think about driving your car. You're not just reacting. You're actually watching if you're driving, if you're paying attention, right? You're actually predicting other drivers' behaviors around you and in front of you and behind you, and you're acting based on those predictions. And hopefully those predictions hold true, but when they don't hold true, that's oftentimes right when you get in an accident. Because your prediction didn't hold for that situation. Okay. So, what does that have to do with agency? Um, this was, this was the, the, the interesting, unexpected uh, thing from, from my research. I ran across these three authors, especially Holland and Rosen, Rosen. And they basically said, if we look at human behavior, we have this feedback paradigm. We're so used to looking at things through this feedback lens. And yeah, it explains some things, but the reality of it is, is Human behavior is a lot easier to explain if you look at it through the pers from the perspective of a feed-forward system, as an anticipatory system. Not only anticipatory, but adaptive. Okay. And this was what this was what got it for me. Holland, in his book, refers to all adaptive systems, all learning systems, as agents. Okay, all bio which includes all biological systems for him. All biological systems are adaptive systems, and there are, of course, non-biological adaptive systems as well. He refers to them as agents. That's what kind of put these two things together for, for me. And then once those two got connected, it's just interesting to me what the implications are for that. Um, so what comes out of that is agents, and this... This is the interesting thing, too, is how well it parallels learning theory, right? Agents have a model of how the world works. We have this model. It's not, it's not complete. We don't know everything. And we operate on that model. And we're evaluate, evaluating those actions. We're adapting those actions. We're learning so that the next time we get into that situation, we know better how to influence that situation. We know what to do the next time better than we did the first time. If our model holds, if our model is sufficient, we assume that our model is correct or good enough, and we don't learn. This is, all, this is Kelly in particular. And it's also Schenck, his idea of expectation failure. If our model fails, then we realize we have an expectation failure, like Schenck says, and now we have an opportunity to learn. We realize we have an opportunity to learn. So that's basically what computer games do. They present a model world in which you can act as an agent. You learn the model, you learn to work on it, you adapt to it um, so that you can achieve the future goal to win the game. Now, as Andy said, a lot of computer games are adaptive. They're getting more adaptive. That's one of the big pushes is to make your non-player characters seem more like human beings so that they adapt to your actions instead of just doing what they were pre-programmed to do. But you can also simulate adaptivity, okay? And one of the ways to do that is through randomization. So rolling a dice, cards, shuffling cards, that, that randomization simulates adaptivity because now the game system is never quite the same you have to adapt to the new order of the cards or the roll of the die or, or who buys park place and who has the railroads, um, things like that. Okay? 
So it's simulating adaptivity. Okay, so I want to look at agency. I'm going to have to go real fast here. These are the common uses, able to act, able to choose. If you need to leave, I'll understand. But as I looked through that, I, I came to the conclusion that, yes, agency requires choice. Yes, agency requires action. But that is a pretty paltry explanation of agency. It just doesn't quite cut the mustard. And one of the reasons is that if you think of it, here's a choice point. Here's a choice point or an action point. What you're saying then is agency is circumscribed right there. That's agency. If you say that, the, the implication is logically that there is no basis for saying whether a choice is good or bad. Right? All choices are equal. If that's all you say is that agency is encapsulated in the choice. All choices are equal. But it doesn't take a stretch to think, wait a minute, all choices are not equal. If you have an animal who faces the choice of fight or flee, is the choice equal? No. One choice, hopefully, will keep them alive. The other one might result in death, right? Those choices are not equal. So being able, to, being able to predict the outcome of those choices would be a very good thing, wouldn't it, in that situation? So agency has got to be more than just choice. So I'm going to throw this out. Um, and I'm still working on this. Um, the, the ability to effectuate a valuable outcome. Excuse, excuse my pop-up. At the same time, preserving agency, right, or expanding agency. That's another little caveat there that all choices do not result in the continuation of agency. If, I, if the animal gets killed, suddenly his agency is curtailed, right? So you want the choice, really, you want the choice that, that preserves your agency or increases it. So this requires a lot of different things. Um, and what I would encapsulate that in, actually, is, this, is put that in two words, wisdom and power. You could do it that way. Wisdom and power. The ability to see what is going to happen, the ability to see what course of events will change what's going to happen, and the ability to make that course of events happen. No. I mean, not dying a death, but has to make mistakes in order to know what was a bad outcome and what was a good outcome. Has to learn, yeah. So, that sounds a lot like some principles that we're familiar with. Yeah. We it, have to make mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. And that in, in the absence of that, we don't have agency. Because he can see the end from the beginning. Mm 